other day I was working on something and my husband came by and he said, I thought you'd finish that. And I said, well, I did, but I just wanted to do a little more. And he said, you're a grind. <laughs> and, and in some ways, I am. I'm a studier. I'm a student. And I wanted to learn how to bake. And so I just worked my way through a bunch of books. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm senior editor Anna Husel, and I'm here with editor-in-chief Matt Rodbard. Today on the show, we have Dory Greenspan, cookie baker, New York Times columnist, and author of many books, including the brand new Everyday Dory. Later on, Anna will be chatting with Lisa Ludwinski of Detroit's Sister Pie. So Dory has been in the game for a long time. I bet she has some stories, Anna. Dory, I found out, was actually one of the first employees at the Food Network in the early 90s, right when the network was first launching. So we talked about kind of what a weird, scrappy, improvisational time that was in television. So Emeril as a young man. She has stories about him. Emeril was just starting out. Julia Child had a baking show. What? Julia Child had a show on the Food Network? That's right. She did, yeah. I also pried for some of Dory's biggest gripes with the baking trends of today. She also told me her favorite place to go grocery shopping every time she's in New York. Here's Anna talking to Dory Greenspan. Welcome to the Taste Podcast, Dory Greenspan. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. You have a new cookbook, which is Everyday Dory, The Way I Cook. You, of course, are famous for your writing about baking, chocolate, cookies... Was it a relief to get to write about something else? You know, it was fun to do this book. I've done one other, I call them soup to dessert cookbooks. Um, and that was around my French table. But that was, that came out in 2010. So that was a while ago. And I, you know, I cook all the time. I know that um, most of my books have been baking and I love to bake. But I'm a responsible human being. I feed people dinner before I give them dessert. That's good. They need that. They need a little salty to balance it out. And everybody does need dessert. So um, it it felt really natural to be doing this book. And your own cooking must have changed in those last eight years. My cooking has changed. You know, sometimes you only know something after it happens and you're looking at it. So I wouldn't have said, if you had asked me a few years ago if my cooking had changed, I'd say, no, I cook. You know, I always cook the same way. But as I was putting together these recipes, I realized that, in fact, my cooking has changed. And I think it's become simpler and more practical. And I think that's because I am, I pinch myself when I say this because I'm so lucky. I live in Paris, New York, and Connecticut. And over the past, it's actually been eight years, um, we've been living more in Connecticut. And in Connecticut, I'm like an hour round trip from a quart of milk. So I've really come to depend on a supermarket as opposed to a cute little specialty store down the street. And on using what I've got at home, making substitutions, uh, opening up my fridge and looking to see what's on the door. And so, yeah, I've I've changed over these years. My cooking has changed. One of the recipes I'm so excited to try, I'm such a sucker for the combination of soy sauce and butter. And I love the recipe for the egg yolks that you kind of marinate in soy sauce overnight and then serve it with buttery rice. Oh, I am so glad you liked it. I was talking to someone about that recipe yesterday, yesterday morning. And and he said, I love that. I said, you know, I hope people will try it because unless you grew up with that, um, it's an unusual combination. So it's rice that, yes, has, has soy, so it's kind of salty rice. And that, that marinates. And then, as you said, there's um, an egg yolk and it's warm and butter. It's, it's an Asian res- recipe, but it's, we're not used to butter in Asian food that much. And the recipe was given to me by a woman I just met by chance. And 
she said, this is a great recipe for children, that children love the rice and the egg and the butter is so nice for kids. And I'm thinking, okay. And then I read where someone said, this is a great recipe if you're drunk and (laughs) want to get over a hangover. Drunk people have similar tastes to children, I guess. I hadn't thought about it that way. (laughs) So it's a recipe that you could have, yes, I guess late at night, you could have it for breakfast. I love it as an afternoon snack when I'm kind of, I work at home, and when I'm kind of dipping at 4 o'clock. Absolutely. It has some of the same components of mac and cheese, too, kind of like starchy, creamy, buttery. Comforting. Comforting, salty. Oh, I'm so glad you chose that recipe. Yeah. Among those three places that you live, when you're in New York, what are the things that you're really excited to eat? Or even groceries that you're really excited to have access to that are harder to find in Connecticut or Paris? So when I'm in New York, paradise for me would be going to Calustians to buy spices. Calustians is so fun. Right. That it's like would, Disney World. Like, it's like Disney World for a cook. That's a great way of, of putting it. I love being able to go to small specialty shops. Um, I have that in Paris as well. I mean, in Paris, I know, I know all of uh, you know the cheesemonger knows exactly. When I was just there a few weeks ago, and she said, "I think you're." I, I said, "My husband had a cold." She said, "Oh, here he loves Conte. Bring this back to him." So. I have those kinds of relationships with um, small food vendors, and I love being able to shop like like that. Do you eat out much when you're in Paris? Yes. Which has a more exciting restaurant scene right now, Paris or New York? Which child do I like more? It's a good thing I had only one. Um, <laughs> It's interesting. They're different. I think the food scene in New York, New York is a great town for restaurants. Great. Paris is changing, and it's been interesting to me to see how the classic bistros are maintained and continue, but everybody's doing something a little different, and there's now a lot of influence coming from Asia um, into the um, restaurant scene in in Paris. So it's exciting to see see how it's changing. That is. I was recently reading that you... Early in your career, worked at the Food Network in 1993. Is that right? Is that the year it was? I worked there. I had to. I had to buy a television to work there. I didn't have one. <laughs> I worked there right before it launched. We called it TFN, the Food Network, and it was on some channel that was like nine thousand and two on cable, and. I, yeah, I, I worked there right before they launched and for about six months after. What was it? What was the Food Network like 25 years ago? It was a kind of crazy place. When we started, we were in a studio that might have been somebody's one-bedroom apartment. It was um, – I, I might be exaggerating or de-exaggerating. Um, it was really – it felt like – like, hey, kids, let's put on a show. It felt very scrappy. It was very scrappy. It felt very exciting because there really wasn't a, there wasn't food television. We had fabulous shows on public television in the mold of Julia Child and really, you know, beautifully produced food. This was really a startup in every sense of the word. And it was exciting to be doing something new. It was exciting to be working with people who thought, oh, we're breaking new ground. We're pioneers. We're going to make something. Who were the, what were the big heavy hitters of the Food Network at that time? Like, what were the shows that people were watching the most? Well, we didn't have any heady, heavy hitters. <laughs> we were just starting. And I remember, Gentle hitters. I remember the um, head of programming saying, we're going to make somebody a star but we don't know who that person will be. So Emeril emerged pretty quickly as um, as a star. David Rosengarten had a really interesting show then. But Emeril, you, Emeril kind of moved away from the pack quickly. Do you miss anything about those early days of food television? I was not cut out for TV work. 
But what I miss is that sense of adventure that we had then, that camaraderie. It it was fun to work on that project early on. Yeah, there were no models, really, for how that was the fun things of it. had to be done. Exactly. That was the fun of it, that we, were, we felt we were really doing something new. And we made some terrible mistakes. We couldn't figure out a bunch of things. Um, we tried doing a call-in show, which seemed revolutionary. Um, and it was it – was, we were learning, and that was exciting. So people were calling in with their food questions? <laughs> we tried that. It didn't <laughs> – Yes. I mean, technology was different then also. I mean, now it would be so easy to do any number of interactive things. But we had this idea. In fact, Sarah Moulton, I think, or Michelle Irvet, or I'm not sure, did the first call-in show. Wow, oh, kind of like a public access <sighs> Kind of field. like a, it, we, Eventually, I think they almost worked it out. Wow. Also early in your career, you wrote a book with Julia Child. I did. So that's actually, it's such a funny story. I was working at the Food Network when I was asked to write Baking with Julia, the book that would accompany the baking series that Julia was going to do. And I said, no. Why? I said, it's a, well, I said, it's a great opportunity, but I'm now, I'm given up writing. I'm now a television person. And I thought, I've just started on this new path. I'm learning so much because... As I said, I had to buy a TV, so I was learning a great deal working at the Food Network. And so I said, sorry, no, not for me. And then a few months later, I found myself really missing writing and missing the work that I had done before. And I called and said, who'd you get to write the book? And they said, we haven't found anyone yet. I thought, oh, my lucky day. I said, sign me up. I'm there. <laughs> what was it like baking with Julia? What was her baking style or attitude like? Actually, Julia Julia did so many things so well, and she loved baking, and she had studied baking. She had studied years ago at the Cordon Bleu, but she would truly study things at home. She would test. She would take notes. She would retest. But she wasn't as as comfortable baking as she was cooking. And in the program, in the series, she acted as the host. And we had 27 bakers and pastry chefs and artisan bread bakers come to her home, which was set up as a studio. Her kitchen was set up as the studio, and and bake with her. And it was terrific to work with her. She was so curious. She wanted to know everything. And because she was so curious, she was the perfect Every baker. She was the perfect person to ask just the right question to get the answers that we all needed. Yeah, kind of a perfect mediator between these experts who are highly trained in pastry and the audience who may not have had any experience in baking. Exactly. And she did it so well because she was really interested. She was really curious and she wanted to know. It was a terrific experience working with her. A life changer. Seriously, yeah. How did you first learn about pastry and baking? Did you go to culinary school? No, no, I learned at home. I, I was <laughs> the other day. I was working on something, and my husband came came by, and he said, um, "I thought you'd finish that." And I said, "Well, I did, but I just wanted to do a little more." And he said, "You're a grind," <laughs> and and in some ways I am. I'm a studier. I'm a student, and I wanted to learn how to bake. I couldn't go to culinary school, and so I just worked my way through a bunch of books. Do you feel that things have changed a lot for women working in the pastry profession from you know say the eighties to now, and how? How much have things changed? Is there still work to be done? Yes, there's still work to be done, but boy, is it different. So when I – forget the fact that I was incompetent, untrained, and probably should never have been hired by anyone. I still wanted a job. And I went – somebody said, I know a pastry chef who's desperate for an apprentice. I said, oh, I want the job. I want the job. She, she said, well, you'll have to go for an interview knocked on his office door. He greeted me in French, never asked me if I spoke French, did the entire interview in French, and kept saying, 
I'm looking for a boy. I'm looking for a boy. And finally I said, I'm not a boy. He said, yes, and you don't get this job. And at that time, there were so few women in the kitchen. And something like that being told, you won't get this job because you're a woman, was very common. It was not a woman's world. And things have changed. Things have certainly changed in pastry. We see so many more women in the pastry kitchen. But um, I think there's – it's – it's still a, I think it's still a difficult environment in many places for women. I guess now it's a little more unspoken. It's less overt, but it's still there. It's been a long time since I've worked in a kitchen, um, you know, a professional kitchen. I'd like to think that it's getting better, but I know that it's still it's still hard for women. In the past six months or so, We've noticed, on Taste, we wrote a piece about the pre-breast, and we've noticed a huge influx of pre-breast on menus at restaurants, in pastry shops. Is this happening in Paris, too? Well, the pari breast kind of never left the pastry shops and restaurants in Paris, but... Um so that dessert, that's such a great dessert, so it's it's made... it's. It's a circle. It was made to commemorate um, the bicycle race between Paris and Brest in, in Brittany. And so it's essentially a bicycle wheel. Made out of shoe paste. Made right? out of puff Similar pastry. Similar to shoe making pa- an eclair right. in a little wheel. Exactly. And, and the traditional cream that filled it, so you would cut the shoe paste horizontally and you would fill it with a praline um, cream. And now we're seeing it with berries and with mocha or with chocolate or with only vanilla. But it's such, so many classic French desserts are like this. They're perfect for variation. So you have a basic dough and you can form that dough into any shape or you have the traditional shape like the peri breast and you can fill it with all kinds of things. And it's kind of what makes pastry one of the things that makes pastry so interesting and so much fun to work in, um, Karem, an early pastry chef, said that pastry is the sister art to architecture. And when you look at something like the Paris Brest, you can see how the elements, the building blocks are put together and how you could vary that. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a practical thing to have on a restaurant menu because... Once the staff knows all of the basic techniques, you can remix that and change the menu seasonally or be creative with it. Absolutely. Sure. What other? What else is happening in pastry in Paris right now? I'm actually going to Paris in a few weeks, so this is kind of out of self-interest <laughs> that I'm asking. What do I have to look forward to? Oh, you have a lot to look forward to. So I don't know when you were last there, but back to the shoe paste, Eight Claire are huge. There are entire shops that sell only eclair, sweet and savory. Mm. I've seen kind of what looks to me as a New Yorker to be a play on bagels and lox, but is in fact an eclair with um, cream cheese and smoked salmon and capers. Mm. Yeah. So once again, that form, you know, is perfect for for variation. There are also cream puff shops that look more like... um, American cupcake shops, Say, you know, similar similar idea. I'm seeing a lot of pastry that you knew in one shape being being made in another. So a lemon tart that's now square, hmm. a raspberry tart that ha- that's that's almost like the peri breast. So it's made as a wheel, and it's interesting to me because. I think about pastry night and day, but it's interesting to me to see how just changing the form of something changes the way you look at it, how it appeals to you, and it changes the portion that you get when you cut it. So you've taken a dessert we all know and made something new with it. Yeah, and it kind of changes the way you share it, too, the way you eat it as a group of people. Of course, yeah, exactly. 
There's also in the United States, of course, there's a big trend towards healthier baking, flour alternatives, gluten-free baking. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that in pastry shops in Paris at all? Yeah, there are a few shops that specialize in gluten-free pastries. There are some, I'm, th I'm thinking of one place in particular, but I see it elsewhere, people using different flours, playing around with a mix of flours. I don't, I don't see this trend being as strong in Paris as it is here, um, but it's, it's happening for sure. What do you make of it? Have you done much baking with alternative flours? I haven't done much. I've done some. I'm interested in, I love using rye for the flavor. It also makes things just a little tender. I like using cornmeal. Um, I like being able to change flowers for texture. I haven't, I haven't worked, I, I haven't done much work on gluten-free baking. Are there any trends in baking right now that you are just ready to let them die out? What would you be okay seeing <laughs> leave the stage in 2019? Oh, that's a hard question. What can mm, I I could do without almost anything that's overdone. Not not overbaked, but just because okay. I I am okay. I'm finished with. There is something that I really don't <laughs> like. I don't like anything that's underbaked. So I don't like pies that are pale. I don't like tarts that are pale. I don't like cookies that are so big that their insides are un, just about unbaked raw. I feel like you're you're not getting all the flavor that you can get out of butter and sugar if you're not getting color on it. So I could do away with pale. What about lava cakes? Does that fall into that category? No. Nope, 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 nope. I can take a lava cake. Okay, lava cakes are safe <laughs> lava, in 2019. Lava cakes are okay. Yeah, they're, safe for, <laughs> they're safe for next year. Um, that's, a different, that's a different thing. That's almost like a change in texture. And the ingredients that are in the center of a chocolate lava cake, you could easily eat with a spoon and think you were having, you know, warm pudding. But a cookie... Cookie dough is one thing. Warm, underbaked cookies, that I, they just don't appeal to me. Yeah. Personal, but... And now there are all these places that sell just the scoops of the cookie dough. Have you seen these? I haven't seen this. Maybe this is just in New York. <laughs> just the dough? Yeah, like scoops of uh, food-safe cookie dough that you eat with a spoon like ice cream. Okay. You try it. I would let it live until next year. <laughs> <laughs> another question, another opinion question. What's a totally unnecessary kitchen tool or gadget that you have that you just like can't live without? Totally necessary. Totally unnecessary or kind of frivolous or a little bit uh, something that you could live without, but you personally. That I'd rather not. Yeah. So I could live without my two squeezers, um, the one for the limes and the one for the lemons. They're not electric. They're just those. One is yellow for lemon and one is green for lime. Um, there are a million ways to squeeze a lemon or a lime, but I get such pleasure out of using my little press. And they're not small, so they do take up space, but mm, yeah, I want them. Is it important to have both? Are they different sizes? No, I've What's overdone the distinction? it. They are, they are different sizes. You could put a lime in your lemon press, but but I don't. You want to have the perfect I have place, the set. I have the matched pair, yes. What about grapefruits? Do they make an extra big one for grapefruits? Oh, no. Do I have room for one of those? I don't know if they do. <laughs> <laughs> what would be your next dream cookbook if you could write about whatever you want? no matter how weird. If your publisher let you write anything. Oh. Oh, if my publisher... Okay. So how about dream, right? 
I get to take the next two years to travel around the world, and I have no responsibilities. I don't have to worry about deadlines. I don't have to worry about – I don't have to worry about – I'm free for two years. I would take my husband on this one. Um, And we would travel around the world for two years just meeting all – all the most interesting food people, spending it, spending time in their kitchens, learning their secrets, getting to work alongside them, and to write about that. That sounds great. Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> I hope some publishers are listening. <laughs> and last question before we before you head out, if. Our listeners cook one recipe from Everyday Dory this weekend. What is the one recipe that you really hope people will cook? You know, you didn't tell me you were going to ask such hard questions. I know. I'm putting you on the spot. So there's a recipe in Everyday Dory that I have – I've already worn it out. And I love the recipe. I've never served it to anyone who hasn't loved it. And I think in some way it embodies the spirit spirit of the kind of cooking that I'm doing in this book. So it's the recipe for the oven charred tomato stuffed peppers. And the oh there are so many things I love about this recipe. So I'll just describe it to you quickly. Um, peppers, I like red and yellow for this, but it pee anything. Cut in half. We're talking about sweet bell peppers. We're talking about sweet bell peppers. Okay. And so cut in half, top to bottom. And I put – I love when there's a surprise in a dish. When when you get something you didn't expect or there's something hidden or there's a flavor that you didn't think would be there. And so the surprise in the peppers is a mix of breadcrumbs, lemon zest, juice that I get from my favorite lemon juicer, (laughs) um, and anchovies. And so it's a very – it's a – really flavorful mix. So you have the pepper, you have this breadcrumb mix. I put a little fresh lemon over it. And then cherry tomatoes that I cut in half, and then I fit as many of them as I can into the pepper. Fresh herbs, olive oil, right? And roast it until everything is soft and charred and the peppers are, are kind of sweet. And I love this recipe because of the surprise, because it's more like an arts and crafts project than cooking. I mean, none of the recipes in the book requires technique, but this is really, you could be the first time, this could be your first time in the kitchen and you'd be a star with this. It's versatile because you can swap the breadcrumbs for quinoa or for rice or for any you know, any kind of grain that, that you have. You can serve this hot. You can serve it warm. You can serve it at room temperature. You could take it to a picnic. It could be a starter. It could be a side dish. So this is kind of, my husband says I'm a what-if cook. I start with a recipe and I think, well, what if I made it this way? What if I added time to this? What if um, I, I, I serve this in a picnic bag. What if I put ricotta over it? And so this is the kind of recipe that is simple to make. It's beautiful. It's delicious. And it starts your own what if thinking. You get to, you get to make this recipe your own. I love that. I can't wait to make that for some dinner parties this fall. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Story. It's been so much fun. Thanks so much for having me. Here's Anna speaking with Lisa Ludwinski. Lisa Ludwinski, welcome to the Taste Podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So you are the owner of Sister Pie in Detroit. It's just about Thanksgiving season. Is this your craziest season? It is our craziest season. And then add the fact that I just came out with a cookbook and we are going truly mad. But it's really actually a very fun time for us because... We all kind of have to really team team up together and, and bust through a lot of stuff. And I think everyone gets a lot of good energy from that. How many pies do you wind up making during the week of Thanksgiving? 
So last year we did a thousand, and that was the first time. That was like a huge jump for us, and so we're going to do a thousand again this year to kind of really kind of understand what that number means. Um, because you know, in a normal week, we're making more in the couple hundred pies. So this is a huge, uh, a huge increase. <laughs> do you then go home and make pies for your family as well for your own no, Thanksgiving celebration? Definitely not. My mom has learned to put her order in, you know, the first day that the orders go on sale. So she takes care of that. She picks what she wants. And then I think they still generally will have a few regular pumpkin pies at our Thanksgiving as well. I usually spend the holiday sleeping. That's good. I can only imagine you're probably working around the clock during that week. Pretty much. Uh, What's your most popular pie during Thanksgiving? Well, this year we did something a little bit differently, which was we normally have a double crusted apple pie for Thanksgiving. So It's either been the apple sage gouda or the apple cheddar rye. And it's uh, something that we've always – it's definitely like a struggle to make a lot of those pies the way that we want to make them um, in in bulk, really. And so this year we decided to revisit a recipe from a while ago that's uh, called apple butter custard. And so it's a single crusted pie. We make apple butter in the oven and then we mix it with a custard filling, add some sliced apples and bake it in the oven. And so it's like very cinnamon sugar, spicy, um, and it's sold out already. And then the orders just went on sale yesterday. Wow. Yeah. Uh, how far in advance do people start placing their Thanksgiving orders? Uh, well, we usually we usually publish the menu about a month to a month and a half before Thanksgiving. And so this year it was basically a month. And so that's – I think we're – close to selling out of everything already. Wow. Yeah. People tend to be really intimidated by making pie at home. Is pie crust as hard as everybody thinks? I don't think so. I teach pie classes a couple times a month at our shop. And when I show people the way that I do it and when I walk them through it and then I immediately have them do it themselves, the the, the big takeaway is always that was a lot of um, – it took a lot of muscle, but it wasn't – like complicated. It wasn't hard for me to understand. And I think that people have a lot of fear surrounding pie dough. There's a lot of myths about pie dough. There's a lot of fear that you could make it too warm or you could overwork it or you could do this or that. And so I think that just people think, ah, it's not worth it. I'm just going to buy store bought. But when people take our class and hopefully when they read the recipe in the book, they'll they'll give it a shot. And I think the, the real secret is just practicing a lot. And getting the feel for it. Yeah, kind of developing your own intuition around it so that um, it's less about following the recipe and more about what you know. Are you team butter, team lard, team shortening? I'm definitely team butter. Um, I always really just loved the taste of butter and pie dough, and so it was important for me to to make it that way at the shop. Um, Lard didn't seem attractive to vegetarians, of course. So we, we decided to not do that. Um, and we use Plugra unsalted butter. So it's just such a flavorful, delicious butter. And we use it in all of our baked goods. And it really makes the pie crust shine. Um, I always tell the students in the class that I want the the pie dough and crust to taste just as good as whatever's inside of it. And so the butter helps a lot. Tell me about Plugra. I always see it at the grocery store. It's a European butter, right? It's a European-style butter. So what that means is it has a higher butter fat percentage than traditional American-style butter. So it's just a couple percentage points, but it really makes a difference because, of course, what that means is that there's more flavor. Fat brings more flavor, and that's what we're really looking for in pie dough. It not only creates a better tasting pie dough, but it also creates a flakier pie dough because of all of that fat that can kind of then burst once it hits the hot oven. Is that fat content more similar to shortening or lard than your traditional American butter? I would imagine so. I don't. I actually haven't worked with um, shortening or lard, um, but I think that, that that would make sense. Daniela Galarza just recently wrote a piece for Taste about malted milk powder. Mm. And you use malted milk powder in a very interesting way in one of your pies. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So the pie is our malted lime, and it's one of my favorite pies because key lime, just growing up, was 
one of the best pies that I had ever tasted. And so we wanted to do a version of our own. Um, and I was just kind of experimenting with ways here and there to make it a little bit unique. And we had malted milk powder in the kitchen from I don't even know what. And I threw it in there and it just kind of brought this extra level of I want to say, like, I guess dairy to it. Like, it just it, – it tames the lime a little bit because, you know, lime pie is usually very, very tart. The malted milk powder makes it a little bit more approachable, I think. Um, and then we also put the milk powder in the crumb that goes on top. So instead of having a graham cracker crust, we have an all-butter crust, a flaky all-butter crust. Then the filling goes inside, and then there's this kind of malted crumb that goes on top, a malted graham crumb. And I think I definitely um, learned a lot about using malt powder when I worked at Momofuku Milk Bar. And I kind of learned, like, the various ways that it can be used, either as, like, like we also, so in the lime pie, we use the malted milk powder also as the thickener. So it replaces, like, cornmeal or flour or something else that we might use in a pie similar to that style. So you can make kind of a custard texture. With yeah, it. exactly. With eggs as well. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so that's been great. And uh, we use it in a malted molasses cookie and then also in a salty, malty chocolate scone. Cool. Yeah. What were you using malted milk powder in at Milk Bar when you were working with Christina Tozzi? I think, oh, there was a chocolate malt cake. And so the chocolate milk cake had malt, I think, in every aspect of it. She used milk powder in, like, tons of things. Um, So there was the malt that was just specifically in that cake, but then actual just, like, plain milk powder wasn't everything from her cookies to her pie fillings um, to the uh, cereal milk soft serve. Is that about flavor or texture or kind of both? I think it's both. I think the milk powder at Milk Bar really achieved like a nostalgic texture. Or uh, excuse me. I think it really achieved a nostalgic flavor because it's in a it's added to a lot of things like cereal or, um, you know, instant breakfast or the things that you would have when you were a kid. And I think it really brought that nostalgia in um, almost in the way that. She would use like imitation vanilla extract for the birthday cake because, you know, she thought that that brought more of the nostalgia in. And I think that's really what it was about. So getting your start baking in New York, what made you decide to open a bakery in Detroit? So I was working um, at a couple of bakeries and I was really enjoying the transition from being a home cook and baker to a professional baker. I liked doing the things, you know, in a scaled up way. I I really enjoyed the environment of it and I enjoyed the hustle and the work and, and just the the feeling of, of making something and being able to know that someone else is going to enjoy it. And a lot of people at that. At the same time, I was really kind of missing something in my life. I wasn't sure what it was, but I was kind of opening myself up to exploring that. And when I was working um, at Milk Bar, I got the opportunity to do an internship um, at back in Michigan, where I was from. And so I worked at um, a place called Avalon International Breads and then Zingerman's Bakehouse, both businesses that are known, well known in their own ways, um, and definitely embody triple bottom line missions. So these were businesses that were not just concerned with having, you know, like the best tasting cookie or bread. They were concerned with making a good place to work, um, being environmentally friendly, and they really kind of wore their hearts on their sleeves about that. And that was something that was really appealing to me. Um, And I felt similarly when I visited San Francisco and and ran into some cooperative bakeries and employee-owned businesses. And that was where the kind of pieces came together for me. And I thought, okay, that's the kind of business I want to start. I want to be able to come up with new ideas and new concepts. And I think Detroit is the place that will receive that well. What would you, how would you describe your mission and the mission of Sister Pi? So the mission of Sister Pie does really include this commitment to a triple bottom line. I mean, I think first and foremost, we're here to celebrate food and each other um, through the seasons of Michigan. And that's how we um, decide how to make which pies every month. But the triple bottom line being, you know, people, planet, and profit. And that really informs all of the decisions that we make. We're not approaching decisions from the standpoint only of um, how much money is this going to make us, but we're thinking about 
how did this person feel when they ate it? Or how did they feel when they walked into our store? Or how does this employee feel like they're being taken care of here? Um, are they enjoying their work? Are they able to feel challenged? Are they able to feel like they can afford to live somewhere? Um, and then how much waste are we producing? You know, as a food business, you're naturally going to produce a lot of waste and use a lot of, of product. And so how can you get creative about that? Um, and so I think that's like really where our mission is rooted, um, is in those three things. For the first, you know, first few years of the business, we focused mostly on the people aspect. And I that just sort of came naturally because all the people were in front of me all the time, you know? And I think sometimes I feel like, ah, oh, man, I really should have focused on the money aspect first, but we had a popular enough product that people were buying it. And I think it's really great that we've been able to focus on people now when we're small so that it remains the standard when we might make more money and be able to offer, you know, more benefits and things like that. Can you ever see yourself opening a bakery in another city or is it all about Detroit? to you? I think it's pretty much all about Detroit. It would have to be a pretty special circumstance or opportunity to open outside of Detroit. And I'm just not sure if I've been in, if I've encountered that yet. Um, but really, I think what makes Sister Pie special is the experience of going to Sister Pie. Now, people can experience Sister Pie from far away, you know, from Instagram or the cookbook or when they come to visit even. Um, but the the feeling that like the people in our neighborhood or the people in our surrounding area can get when they walk in and they have a tradition there, that's something that I really strongly don't feel can be replicated. And I think for some businesses that works great to, you know, make other locations and, and things. But as soon as Sister Pie was established in the spot that it is in, it, it became clear that that wasn't going to be the case for us. Um, so we're trying to think about kind of different ways to expand. And I'm sure as the person creating recipes, there's something fulfilling about getting to see people in person actually eating the pies. Absolutely. It was something that used to terrify me when I when it was more like me giving pies and cookies to family and friends because they're not always going to be uh, – well, they're always going to be pretty honest with me, I think. Um, but – it's And it's not just me being able to see it. I think it's the staff being able to participate in the act of making things. And our kitchen is, is very open, so um, customers can see what's going on pretty much at any given point. And I think that the fact that they get to experience that joy that the customers feel gives us all kind of a, a reason to keep going every day. You talk a little bit in the book about kind of like the collaborative, creative energy in your kitchen and the way staff members kind of have their own input into the creative process. What does that look like in the kitchen? Like, what is it like when you bake with, with your staff? And what are the kinds of ideas that come up that way? I think a great example of this is our scones. Um, there's something that we can easily change all of the time. And I actually have one employee who will randomly text me ideas for breakfast items in, like, the middle of the night when she thinks about them. And so for us, it's like everyone knows what's available, like, because we're working with the seasons. And so we get things from the farmers. And then, of course, we have our full pantry in front of us. So a lot of times it's it's people just saying, hey, wouldn't this sound good or doesn't this sound good? Or a customer uh, recommended this and when it's something like scones, it's easy to say like, hey, let's let's try it and let's work it out. Um, when it comes to developing flavors for pies, it takes a little bit more recipe testing. And I think what's been tough about running the business the past few years is that recipe testing has kind of taken a backseat to everything else that we do every day. But I definitely want it to grow as something that is like even more collaborative and that people feel like they have a contribution. Um, because I think when I first started the business, it was very much about my taste and what I wanted to eat and what I wanted to make. Um, so that there was even like a little bit of, of ego in that. Um, and I think as time has gone by, I've realized that what's more important to me is making the food accessible and making it something that everyone can get excited about. And, and maybe you won't always get excited about this one thing. But if my employees can be involved in that process, then they'll feel ownership, and that's what I want them to feel. Have there been any totally surprise hits in the pie, in the pie on the pie menu? Like, what's the craziest thing you've tried that really kind of took off? Hmm. Usually, the question is, "What's something that was terrible?" <laughs> yeah, no, I want to know that too. Yeah, um, worst pie you ever made. The worst pie. 
Well, the worst pie I ever made was like when I was trying to do a pumpkin molasses pie, and I just couldn't get the balance of the molasses right. So every time we did it, it was just like molasses flavor, and it's strong. It's a very flavor. strong flavor. It just it seemed like oh yeah, that would make sense. But we'll leave the molasses to the cookies for now. Um, well, one pie that everyone was super skeptical of when I was first developing it was the sweet beet pie. Mm. Um, and I, I originally thought of it because we were thinking of what to do for Valentine's Day. And I thought, I want to do a hot pink pie. And, of course, beet color, red beets color everything beautifully hot pink um, and magenta. And you get them in February. Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, it was a process of, like, pureeing the beets and or, like, roasting the beets, pureeing them, and then trying to find the right balance to make it not taste like an earthy pie. Mm-hmm. And so I think what we've actually established as something that's almost more like for some reason it reminds me of red velvet and I think it's like the combination of the color which doesn't really have a taste um, in red velvet but that mixed with the cream cheese that goes into the filling so I'm thinking about the the icing that usually goes on red velvet cake Um, and it's also something that like when you say red velvet with beets it's like oh yeah I guess I could try that Um, yeah weren't original red velvet cakes made with beets that's so true yeah I totally forgot about that. Um, so it's really good, and most of the people, even the ones who don't like beets, like the pie. And beet is a strong flavor. Like people who don't like beets typically won't eat anything with beet in them. Um, so I think we've really tamed it in this pie, and it's one of my favorite pies to eat. So I'm pretty proud of it. Is it like a cheesecake texture? Yeah, kind of? that's what I'm picking. Yeah, with definitely. The cream mm-hmm. What other flavors go with beets on like the dessert scale? Um, Vanilla. I think like cinnamon brown butter so we we use brown butter in the recipe which really complements them well and i think would be good in a sweet or savory application um and then i i believe there's a little bit of yogurt in the recipe too so just like trying to find like really nice um rich dairy elements to combine with the earthiness and and the sweet the natural sweetness of the beet um bringing those out there's not much added flavor beyond that what is Detroit like as a food city right now? And what have you noticed changing about it since you've been running a business there? Well, one thing is that I can't keep up with how many places are opening. And so when I drive around, I mean, I don't really have a life outside of Sister Pie, so I'm not going out too often. But um, when I'm driving around, I see new places that I hadn't heard about. And when I was first back in Detroit, every time a new restaurant or coffee shop or anything opened, it was like a really big deal in the press. Um, And so I've definitely seen it change a lot. Um, The scene is a mixture. I think it's a lot of businesses like mine who I think moved to Detroit with the intention of opening a triple bottom line style business. Um, I'm part of an organization called Food Lab um, that, that kind of helps foster those ideals in a business and sort of a community of of like-minded food entrepreneurs. And then there's a lot of just like really delicious um, kind of fine dining restaurants coming to the city, sort of like stepping um, stepping it up a notch from something like Sister Pie. Uh, And so you'll see a lot of that. A lot of things are still pretty much based in like, I would say like Midwestern comfort is, is pretty popular, but you know. what, what is how would you describe Midwestern comfort? Like, what does that look like in terms of what people are eating? Um, I mean, I think I felt it more when I first moved back. But like, it was like, you know, I, I know that when I lived in New York, there was like a bacon moment, and it felt like the bacon moment in Detroit just happened like a little bit later. Oh, so okay. I like had two bacon moments, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit slowed down. Yeah, um, but I also think. Like Michigan is the second most agriculturally diverse state in the whole country. And so I think the chefs there are really interested in that. And and specifically what's so cool about Detroit is that there's so many fruits and vegetables growing right in the city. And so so many of the chefs and bakeries get to use Detroit-grown produce. And that's something that you don't see in every city, every major city as much. Um, but there's a lot of urban farms in Detroit. It's great to be able to work with them and kind of see it displayed in the restaurant. So you see those values reflected a lot in Detroit. Um, and even just like the greater area beyond Detroit has a lot, a lot of farms. So, yeah. And, and you re- you really do see like a lot of Middle Eastern influence in Detroit because we have um, Dearborn right 
next to us, which is like the I, th- I believe like the largest population of Middle Eastern people in the whole country. Um, and so there's like delicious, delicious Middle Eastern food. And I think because of that, a lot of chefs are inspired by those flavors. What are some of the Middle Eastern flavors or dishes that you've discovered since you've been there? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a place called Shatila Bakery in Dearborn, and it's just like this crazy dessert emporium. And they have all sorts of pastries, but what I really go there for is the ice cream. Mm. And there's an ice cream flavor called rose pistachio. And we have a rose pistachio shortbread cookie. And so I think it's kind of inspired by that flavor combination, which is kind of a classic Middle Eastern flavor combination. And it works really well in the ice cream. And it works really well in the cookie, which is probably my favorite shortbread cookie that we make. Yum. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the national conversation about Detroit right now kind of tells a story of like rapid development Mm. and gentrification. Is there anything missing from that narrative? Like, do you think that national news and travel and food media get Detroit right? Or Mm -hmm. is there any part of the story that they're kind of missing? I think what I hear a lot in the media is revitalization, resurgence, um, on the rise, up and up, all that, these kind of words that suggest movement forward. Um, and new life. And while there is a lot of that happening, what I struggle with is that there, what seems to be lacking in the media is a attention to the people who have lived in Detroit for a really long time and the businesses that have been in Detroit for a really long time. Because what you'll notice is that a lot of the businesses that are getting attention and a lot of the people who are getting attention for doing things in Detroit for the past 10 years, a lot of them have been white people. Detroit is an 85% black city. And so that is something that I think people are people in Detroit are very aware of and talking about, but I don't see it talked about as much in the national press. Um, I think it's it's really easy to want to say, hey, Detroit's doing better. Like, let's all, you know, clap and be happy for Detroit. And And while that's great, I think it's really interesting to be in a city as areas are gentrifying and, and also be neighbors with folks who are saying, this isn't what I want. I haven't been heard for years and years. Um, how can we like work together to make a solution? And so I would say that the best word to describe Detroit is complicated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Last question before we let you go bake a thousand pies for Thanksgiving. <laughs> I think that I saw that you used to have a web series. Ah, <laughs> gosh. Yeah. Is this, do you have secret TV aspirations? <laughs> you really did your homework on this one. <laughs> uh, yeah, when I was living in Brooklyn, I started, it was my, my first foray into cooking. I started a little show called Funny Side Up in my kitchen. Um, it traveled with me to like, all of the New York apartments that I lived in. Um, And I would put my laptop on top of my refrigerator and and film a new recipe every week. And at that time, I really did have TV aspirations. I mean, you know, I grew up like obsessively watching the Food Network and basically wanting to be the next Ina Garten one day. Sure. Maybe I still could be. And so, yeah, I think like I had a theater past. um, So I studied theater in college and I moved to New York originally to pursue that. And so this was this like great merging of my passions that I was able to to create. And that was really, really fun for me. And I think kind of like sparked a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, just sort of like, I'm going to make this what I want to make it. And we'll see how it goes. Uh, If you're trying a new recipe once a week, then you're going to learn something about cooking. Exactly. Yeah. And I totally did. um, Because I did a 100 episodes of it. And so I think the thing was like, I was never making anything more than once. So I wasn't like, truly developing skills, but I was kind of dabbling in everything. And then it, I think it was from there that I, you know, worked at the bakeries. And, and so I think I'd be happy to explore that option again. Um, if you could have a TV show about anything, what would your TV show be? Well, one idea I've had is I, I'd love to be able to do like a travel cooking series around Michigan, including the Lower Peninsula and the Upper Peninsula, because it's such a big state. And talking about its agricultural diversity, and there's just so much to see there, stuff that I haven't even experienced. And um, I'd love to be able to kind of do something like that. 
and highlight some of the cool local businesses exactly. that have been there forever. Yeah, totally. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Great to have you on the Taste Podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Anna Hiesel and me, Matt Rodbard. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis. Studio recordings by Pat Stango. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste Online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.